This is Bible Academy. Today we continue our series, A Survey of the Old Testament, and we'll be looking at the book of Habakkuk. Now before we get started, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and are allowing the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the opportunity, the privilege, and all that you provided so we can study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds be open and ready to receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. Habakkuk, the purpose. To examine the issue of God's justice on a national level. To show how God can use a wicked nation like Babylon as his instrument for punishment. A major theme, God's policy towards the nations. God's presence, God's presence arrives to carry out his judgment. I think it's uh, quite remarkable that as we've gone through these books, uh, even going back to as far as the wisdom books, that there's a progression of knowledge that we should be building up regarding our Old Testament theology in the area of justice. We saw it individually with Job. Now we see it on a national level, and we've seen different uh, aspects of that with the other prophets as well. So we're going to focus on the subject of God's justice towards nations. Let's look at the outline. It's a, another short book, three chapters. One, a discourse. Discourse one, we have a prayer, Habakkuk's complaint concerning Judah. B, the answer, oracle of judgment, Babylon to invade Judah. That's quite an answer. Two, discourse two, prayer, Habakkuk's questions concerning God's justice. Instruction from God. Answer one, responsibility of the righteous. Answer two, oracle of judgment against Babylon. Three. <clears throat> Discourse three. Prayer. Habakkuk's request for mercy. Reflection. The sovereign power of God to deliver. And then acceptance, Habakkuk's trust in God's sovereignty. <clears throat> Let's look at the introduction. There is no genealogical or historical information given about Habakkuk in the book. Unlike other prophetic books, this one places a higher priority on addressing a particular topic rather than just preserving the oracles of the prophets, of the prophet. In this sense, the book is more like Jonah than Jeremiah. Furthermore, the wisdom tone of the prophecy and its organization around the inquiries of the prophet distinguish it from the rest of the prophetic literature. The wisdom tone is evident in its focus on the justice of God. It's writing. Dating this book is a challenge. Again, we must look within the book at the internal evidence. In 1, 5 through 6, the raising up of Chaldean, some of your translations say Babylonians, is presented as something astonishing and unexpected. The Chaldeans took control of the throne of Babylon, declaring the independence from Assyria in 626 B.C. By 612, Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, had fallen, but as early as 614, the alliance between the Medes and the Babylonians laid the foundation for their eventual success against Assyria. So what we're talking about here is the rise of Babylon. The statement, raising the Chaldeans or Babylonians, would make better sense if it was made before 626. So we're trying to get an approximate date here when this book was written. <clears throat> also, the judgment on Judah 
at the hands of the Chaldeans, Babylonians, was coming, and it, and it uses this phrase, the judgment referred to could hardly apply to anything earlier than 597 uh, B.C. when Judea had its first major confrontation with Babylon. So calculating all these numbers, and I know they're kind of hard to follow all this rationalization here from the dates. Basically, we get a date around 640 at this point from using what we've seen so far. Now, this is the year Josiah came to the throne. Remember, he was the good king of the south. Even though he was a good king, his reforms did not come till 12 years later. So what we're seeing here is Habakkuk's complaint about all the bad things that are going on, which would have been still under Manasseh's policies. But in comes Josiah. So I wrote here, so the social justice complaints of Habakkuk would have fit his earlier years, that is the earliest years of Josiah. Remember, he was just a kid, eight years old. Because the policies, with the policies of bad Manasseh, I wanted to make sure you knew he was bad, were still in place. So it takes some years for Josiah to come in with his reforms. In fact, it took like 12 years. So a more precise date may be just after 640 to 630 B.C. This would make Habakkuk a contemporary of Jeremiah. So understand what's going on. The northern kingdom has went down, but now the southern kingdom is looking at big bad Babylon. All right, that's the threat now. It's no longer Assyria. Remember, they were the threat to Judah for a while. But now Babylon is in the neighborhood, the background. Here we go. This tells us about the fall of Assyria and the rise of Babylon. So just listen and you'll, you can maybe laugh at me attempting to pronounce some of these names, but uh, at least you'll get some amusement here. All right, let's go. Ashurbanipal came to the Assyrian throne in 668 BC and inherited an empire that was at its height of glory. Remember, uh, Assyria controlled the world, at least that part of the world. By the end of his reign, however, deterioration was evident and the momentous decline was to come within a few years. Trouble arose as early as the mid 650s when so Medicus I, the Egyptian pharaoh, began to clear the Assyrians out of Egypt. Ashurbanipal could not stop it because he was preoccupied with the civil war taking place in the southeastern part of the empire. So you're at the two, streams, two extremes of the empire now, and uh, Egypt is running the Assyrians out, while on the other end, the Babylonians are in revolt. Let's read this. There, talking about the Babylonian area, his brother, Shamashum Akin, backed by the Enamites and Chaldeans. The Chaldeans is an older name for the Babylonians. Okay, the older name of the Babylonians. They start out as the Chaldeans, the area of Chaldea, and eventually they became the Babylonians in that same area. Well, they were attempting to wrest control of Babylon from Asher Banipal. In other words, they're trying to get Babylon free from the Assyrians, and to establish an independent kingdom. Though the attempt was unsuccessful, the region remained unstable until the collapse of Assyria. Unrest persisted throughout the empire during Ashurbanipal's reign, though Assyria continued to succeed in suppressing any serious challenge to its power. By 630, Ashurbanipal yielded the rule of the faltering empire to his son, Asher Etil Ilani, though it is unknown whether this was done willingly or not. After Asher Banipal's death in 627, the city of Babylon was seized by Sin Shashishkun, the brother of Asher Etil Ilani. A year later, the Chaldeans drove him out and thereby established the independent Babylonian state under the rule of Nabopolassar. He is the one who brought the Near East under Babylonian control and delivered it into the hands of his capable son, Nebuchadnezzar. It is in these days 
of the waning power of the Assyrian that f- forms the backdrop for the prophecy of Habakkuk. So Assyrian Empire is going down. As the Assyrian Empire continued to deteriorate, the reforms of the young King Josiah began to take effect in Judah. Now, without the threat of Assyria, Josiah freely set forth policies for the people to return to covenant life. Purpose and Message The Assyrian Empire had been dominant for almost a century, but by 630 BC their decline seemed irreversible and would lead to a major realignment of world political power. The prophets struggled with the fact that uh, the Assyrians, God's rod for punishment, was passing from the scene with the offense of Judah still going on. Habakkuk's complaint brought the answer from God. Babylon would become the divine means of punishing Judah. This revelation introduces the major topic for the discussion in the book. The purpose of the book is to examine the issue of God's justice on a national plane. The question at hand, that is, the theodicy was how could God allow a more wicked nation to punish a less, a less wicked nation? If Babylon was victorious over Judah, would that not show that God approved more of the Babylonians? This is similar to Job's suffering even though righteous, while other less righteous, even wicked, fared better. Habakkuk deals with the justice of God when a wicked nation prospers. The message of the book is found in God's response. Like with Job, the answer is found in the wisdom of God. Habakkuk recalls the presence of God in his recalling of God's power and the past for Israel. This in itself should promote trust that God knows what he's doing. God provides a twofold answer to Habakkuk's question concerning God's use of the Babylonians. The first part of the answer, 2-4-5, through five, has to do with individual responsibility. We see this again. Individual responsibility. You are all, we are all, each and every one of us, responsible for our actions, no matter how bad the nation is going, doing or how well. Or we might say somewhere in between. Your group is doing bad, you do good, see. There's no excuse for you as an individual to be doing the right thing, no matter how bad things are around you. So the first thing he addresses in the answer to Habakkuk's prayer, God addresses the individual. Verse 4, see the enemy is puffed up. There's your pride. His desires are not upright, but the righteous people will live by his faithfulness. Now this is often translated, but the righteousness will live by faith. Same verse. 2.5. Indeed, wine betrays him. He is arrogant and never at rest because he is as greedy as the grave and like death is never satisfied. Interesting analogy, isn't it? He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captives, captive all the peoples. Even when the purposes of God are hidden to man, the righteous person is responsible to to conduct himself with integrity. Some of you will probably be listening to this while the coronavirus thing is going on. I don't know when it's going to end at this point, but remember, you're responsible for God. If you don't know what's going on, if you don't fully understand it, don't worry about it. We chalk it up to the wisdom of God. He knows exactly what he's doing. When circumstances are difficult to understand, it is not the time to lessen one's walk with God. In fact, one should bear down even more. Though it may be more difficult, it is more significant. In dark situations, it is the beacon of the righteous believer that shines brightest. 
The second part of the answer offers some assurance with regard to God's justice. The message of 2, 6 through 20 was that God would punish the Babylonians for their wickedness, but that the time had not yet come. Six woes would come to the Chaldean Babylonians. We see them in 2, 6, 9, 12, 15, and 19. The woes announce what they did, what the Babylonians did, and then what is coming back on them, administered from the justice of God. For example, let's look at 2.6. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How long must this go on? So there you are in business or observing business and watching how people treat others unfairly. It can come in any number of ways. They sell inferior product. They overprice a product. They charge too much interest. Uh, they force you to go into credit or go into debt. I mean, the list goes on. 2-7. Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Now here's the comeback, see. Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you'll become their prey? Because you have plundered many nations, the peoples who are left will plunder you. For you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. They've been far too cruel with their fellow human being. Just because God used the Babylonians, it does not mean God approves of them. Until their time of punishment came God would use them as he wanted. The structure and organization. <clears throat> the structure of the book of Habakkuk is organized around the prayers of the prophet and the responses of the Lord. The dialogue begins with a complaint about the injustice the prophet sees around him. This brings the main question of the book. Why do the wicked go unpunished? God's response in 1, 5 through 11 states that this would not last for long because that generation of Jews is coming under divine judgment by the Babylonians. This becomes the message. The wicked will not go unpunished. The second prayer of Habakkuk advanced the discussion to the next point. This comes from the Babylonians being involved which is actually which actually raises another question, serious question. Why use this wicked nation? Who is also going unpunished? Habakkuk's inquiries are not harsh or presumptuous. He asks God, truly not understanding why this is the case. God answered by first affirming that it's going to happen. That's in two 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 through three and then went on to answer his question. It is significant that God neither sought to defend his justice or even answer why. Rather, listen to this, he said that man's responsibility is not in having the answers, but responding to God properly. Did you hear that? So many Christians want to spend time discussing why is this going on? Or they want to tell you why this is happening. That's not even the issue. The issue is, are you responding to God properly under these circumstances? The key phrase is, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. The point is, the righteous man will live and maintain a lifestyle of integrity and faithfulness even when he or she does not understand God's ways. This is how those in Judah are to see this. This leads to the oracle of judgment against Babylon 2, 6 through 20, which also elaborates on God's justice. The wicked will be punished. So now we get the punishment part of it, you see. Recognizing his obligation to live in a right relationship with God and to trust that God in his justice will punish the wicked, Habakkuk's third prayer, 3, 1 and 2, requests that God be merciful 
in the exercise of his wrath. So Habakkuk is beginning to understand. He knows Judah's going to get clobbered. Now he's asking, let's don't make it too difficult. Let's don't make it too hard. And he asks for mercy, you see. Let's just look at verse 2. <clears throat> Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, Lord. Repeat them in our day, in our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. Well, this leads to the hymn of 3, 3 through 15. That speaks of God's judgment and deliverance. And reflecting the two answers previously given. The end result of this, 316 through 19, was the acceptance of God's justice and his timing of pouring out his wrath. So basically what we have here and what we're winding up is Habakkuk's not understanding about God's justice towards the Babylonians, why Judah isn't getting punished, and then he starts to get his answers. And they're repeated basically in this last section. Verse 16. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. I think what we see here is how upset Habakkuk was that those people in Judah were getting away with so much and nothing's happening to them. But now he knows it's coming and it's going to be Babylon. Verse 17, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fails, and the fields produce no food, things are going pretty bad. Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, listen to this, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Let me just interpret some of this for you. Verse 17, basically you see, a land in famine. We can't find enough food. We go to the grocery store. All the meat's gone. The milk's gone. Da 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 da. Okay. They don't have any meat in the meat markets. They don't have any meat out there uh, in the um, slaughterhouses. The cattle are gone. Now that's pretty bad. But look at his attitude in verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Now, does he sound worried? Does he sound panicky? Does he sound like he thinks God forgot about him? No. Listen to what he says in verse 19, the first part of it. The sovereign Lord is my strength. It's not all this stuff that is missing. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. Now, you think of having deer feet? Well, what they're saying here is deer are known for their stability. If you've ever seen a deer run in some of the roughest terrain, they, pretty, they do pretty good. They're very good at it. And their legs are built so they can uh, conquer all sorts of terrain. So what he's claiming here, that God guides me through all this difficulty. Point. Our joy does not come from the circumstances around us, but in the God our Savior in whom we trust. That's pretty good, isn't it? Major theme. God's policy toward the nations. The theology of the book is God's policy in dealing with nations. From Jeremiah and other Old Testament books we have studied, we should understand that God weighs the nations on a balanced scale between their good and evil conduct. Now, this is nations, not individuals. All right, let's don't confuse it. Each successive generation either adds to the good or evil side of the scale. 
when the scales leans too far towards evil, picture a large hammer of judgment about to fall on a nation. Uh, sometimes use the expression, the hammer's about to fall. Actually got that from boot camp many, many years ago. Let's look at some of these verses where we get this point. Genesis 18, 20. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. We jump to Genesis 15, 16. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. Notice the Amorites' sin isn't all full yet. It's not time for their judgment. Leviticus 18.25, Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. It's a rather colorful picture. Jonah 1.2, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. And we mentioned this in a previous lesson. God tracks every nation. He knows where they are on, on this scale every second. He knows if it's starting to get way out of hand, he may have to make some adjustments. He knows when it's time for punishment. He may throw a famine. He may put in a uh, some sort of pestilence or uh, uh, wild animals happen to start showing up or unusual animals. Let's look at this next principle. The judgment can be delayed if there's repentance before the ball rolls or the hammer falls. All right, that's what I mean by that. Jonah 3.10, when God saw that they did and how they turned from what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Do you remember that in Jonah? 2 Kings 22.19 and 20, because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you, when you heard what I have spoken against this place and his people that they would become a curse and be laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your ancestors, and you'll be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So they took her answer back to the king. Interesting few additional principles here from which we can further modify, uh, understand the policy of how God deals with nations. Let's look at some. Two, evil deeds can carry into the third and fourth generation. Now we studied that also recently if you're going through the series. If somebody in that generation doesn't repent, then the evil just carries on from generation to generation. The scale is emptied and started new when it is full of wickedness and the judgment is accomplished. So, if something like that happens, if the, either the wickedness comes down and the judgment is accomplished, then basically you start over again. A righteous person may intervene to delay the judgment. That's another principle on a major and gross sin, and when the judgment does come, it will take into account what major, or that major and gross sin. Best way to explain this is to just look at the incident with Moses. Let's look at it. After the incident with the gold calf, Moses pleads to God to not punish them. God did not punish at that time, not to the extent that he was going to, all right, but would at a later time. Let's read this. So Moses went back to the Lord and said, Oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They have made themselves gods of gold. But now please forgive their sin. But if not, then blot me out of the book you have written. 
The Lord replied to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of the book. Okay, that's the penalty. Now go, lead the people to the place I spoke of, and my angel will go before you. However, when the time comes for me to punish, I will punish them for their sin. And that's exactly what happened. They would be blotted out. They wouldn't go into the promised land. That happens some years later. But it didn't happen right then. They did get these, uh, I think this one, the plague. Uh, they got some partial punishment, but that's not blotting them all out, you see. Another principle, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. Now, we saw this in Luke. But you see the same principle here in the Old Testament. But Luke makes it pretty clear because Jesus taught on this. And I wanted to bring in what Jesus taught. If you study Luke with me, then you may remember this. Those who act in ignorance receive less punishment. But those who knew better and failed, they will receive more punishment. God's people, especially those who have been exposed to God's word, have less excuse than anyone to do the Lord's will. God is more tolerant toward the pagan than for his own people. He expects more of his own. We are members of God's family. We need to live like it. More is expected of us. I think of parents would ask parents, don't you expect more of your children because you know they know better than other children? You don't have them running down the aisles in the grocery store or, the, or wherever it is you're shopping because they know better. But there's some kids out there running wild like no one's even said it's wrong. So you might run into an elderly person and knock him flat, you see. Now let's go back to Habakkuk. For Habakkuk, Israel knew better. Besides the covenant, they got warning after warning from the prophets. It was time for the judgment on the Israelites, particularly now it's Judah. The Babylonians' judgment would come later. And I just want to emphasize that we're looking at a national policy here, not individual. This isn't work salvation whatsoever, okay? This is, end, this is a national policy. We're still saved by grace and live by faith. Nations are weighed by their goodness or wickedness because they're not being weighed on them being believers or not. You see, if you remember what we've learned or been taught, God has his rules for the human race on planet Earth. And people as a whole need to follow them. And they're judged by nations. And that's one reason we have nations. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we do thank you for your word. It's another, another challenge for us today in another area of our theology that you have provided for us. Help us understand these things and properly apply them, especially in our day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.